Asian debate of uh, Center for Asian Affairs at the University of Łódź. These debates are supported by Ministry of Education and Science and Polaski Foundation and media support from Radio Łódź, the local radio station. I'm glad to have a very distinguished scholars today with us, namely uh, Susa Ferenczy, uh, Jogana Panda and Jakub Jakubowski from Poland. Uh, the great pleasure to have you all. Let me start this debate with introducing our guest. We will discuss the topic of how to manage China's rise. Uh, the current context is pretty important. China is on a rise, as we see, but due to zero COVID policy and other turbulences inside the country, this is a big dilemma, how to manage this rising or declining China. This is, this is a very big issue. And let me start with the uh, kind of uh, introduction. Zuza Ferenczi is Associated Research Fellow in the Institute for Security and Development Policy. Uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, she's also an affiliated scholar at the Department of Political Science in the Freie University of Brussels, head of Associate Network of Nine Dash Line, uh, research fellow at Taiwan Next Generation Foundation, uh, expert consultant on China, Taiwan, Korean Peninsula, human rights without frontiers. Currently, uh, Zuzus conducts research as a Taiwan fellow hosted by the Ministry uh, of Science and Technology of Taiwan and uh, is associate professor at National Tunghua University in Hualien. Uh, Zuzus' field of expertise are EU foreign policy uh, and security issues, European normative power, uh, and human rights, EU relations with China, Taiwan, uh, and Taiwan uh, in, in the Pacific. And she published a book named uh, Europe, China, and the limits of normative power. So I believe that we will touch these normative issues when it comes to relations with China in the current context. Zuza, great to have you today in uh, our debate. Uh, the, the second speaker is Yoganath uh, 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 Panda, head of Stockholm Center of, for South Asia and in the Pacific Affairs, also an edit editor for uh, Institute for Security and Development Policy in Stockholm, and in this, in, addition uh, to his primary appointment at uh, this uh, center, he's a director of Europe Asia Research Cooperation at uh, Yakasuka Council on Asia Pacific, Senior Fellow of Hack Center for Strategic Studies, Netherlands. And also um, he holds a number of uh, adjunct affiliation with vari various think tanks. Uh, just to name a few, uh, uh, Canon Institute for Global Studies in Japan, then in India, um, United Service Institution, uh, Senior Fellow at uh, East Asia Security Center, and just to name a few. He's author of uh, numerous of publications and well-known scholar across Europe and Asia. Welcome, Yoganath. Good to Thank have you. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, Jakub Jakubowski, uh, Deputy Director of Center for Eastern studies in Warsaw uh, and also fellow with uh, Center for uh, Eastern Studies, China program, coordinator of uh, the Connectivity in Euro-Asia project, a doctor of philosophy in political science and public policies uh, with phases on China's foreign economic policies towards developing countries, uh, including Central Europe. Graduated from Institute of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Warsaw and completed International Economic Relations at Warsaw School of Economics. A Taiwan Fellowship Scholar at Suzhou University 2011, as I've learned from, from the webpage. Uh, lecturer at the University of Warsaw and also uh, Warsaw School of Economics. 2012-2015, uh, uh, he worked as an expert consultant for Polish Small Medium size enterprises and markets in, uh, of Eastern Asia and Commonwealth of Independent States, expertise uh, in China's foreign economic policies, transport, digital and energy connectivity in Euro-Asia space. Uh, welcome, Jakub. Good to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, let me start with the very general question. As I uh, introduced uh, this uh, a minute ago, what is your understanding of current status of China? 
uh, is China still on the rise? Is still China rising? It's not a very peaceful rise as was announced in 2003 uh, uh, by Wen Jiabao and Zheng Bijian, then the president of uh, Central Party School. Is China rising power or declining? And I will start with Zuza. Uh, can you just briefly introduce your perspective from Taiwan? Uh, how do you find China now? Well, thank you. Thank you, Dominic, and thank you so much for the kind invitation. It is really an honor and a pleasure to be on the same panel with uh, all of you. And I look forward to uh, an, in an interesting exchange of views. So indeed, I am in Taipei right now. So it is uh, really uh, the place to be when it comes to understanding what is really happening in the region, I believe. So I'm in a way I consider myself very fortunate that I have this opportunity to really see things unfold from within. Uh, so um, to address the question that you asked, um, how to understand China's rise and China power, I would say, and Chinese influence, I think the best way to look at it is to really um, tackle the question of perceptions. Because I say, I think, think that perceptions inspire China's own self-perception and as countries, and China is no different in this regard, build their identity based on their relationships with other states and according to how they see themselves in relation to others, I think it's really important to start perhaps with the question of how China is perceived in the world. And of course, I sit in Taiwan, so my perceptions uh, as a European in Taiwan might not be the same as someone uh, from Asia in Europe or Europeans uh, in other parts of the world. So I would argue that views of China as a reliable, predictable partner uh, that it has claimed to be and to pursue this development trajectory uh, and someone or a, a state to prioritize cooperation and avoid confrontation, such views have really deteriorated across the world. Now, this is a general statement, so I will go more in detail and into the nuances because, of course, perceptions vary across the world. But overall, I would say that uh, among democracies, clearly there is a... a, a very tangible deterioration um, as China has sought to project confidence internally and externally. Of course, this has uh, uh, had very mixed results, as these perceptions indicate, by silencing internal dissent through authoritarian means and aggressively fighting back against any sort of criticism externally. This has really led, in a way, to a backlash uh, in how China is being perceived. And I would say, I would like to actually mention five uh, factors that have really um, led to such a deterioration in views. Again, again this is uh, perhaps there are more factors, but the discussion is quite brief today, so I would not like to take up too much time. But I think these five factors are quite uh, dominant in terms of shaping these perceptions. So the first, which goes back to the past decade in particular, it's the internal situation in China in terms of human rights, the crackdown on human rights, the authoritarian response to dissent, what we've seen in Tibet, Xinjiang, um, the crackdown on Hong Kong, this has clearly helped or contributed to these views going downhill. Second, Beijing's in, um, increasing willingness to weaponize uh, trade and economic interdependence, which has led also a lot of European leaders to um, uh, conclude that today in China ideology trumps the economy. Number three would be uh, the assertiveness coming out of uh, Beijing in shaping the narrative on human rights and global governance using disinformation and also information manipulation. Uh, number four is the pandemic and what has happened throughout the pandemic, the mismanagement, the lack of transparency, um, uh, coming out of Beijing. And finally is uh, Xi Jinping's diplomatic support to Putin's war against Ukraine. Clearly, these have contributed to a consensus among democracies um, of the need to coordinate a response to address uh, what they perceive, again, a perception uh, as China as an aggressive and coercive uh, power uh, in the region, but also globally. And nowhere is this more visible than in the Indo-Pacific. I would say, uh, a region as a concept, a geopolitical concept that really re-emerged as a response to China's um, assertive behavior in maritime security, 
but also in economic security. So speaking of economic security, China today plays a central role in global economy. Um, it accounts for say about a third of global trade in Australia, about a quarter in Japan, in South Korea. But these relations have been defined more by contestation in more recently and rather than close cooperation. So uh, there is an awareness, there's overall uh, um, a, this consensus that uh, there needs to be a response to China's development. Um, but of course, the perceptions also diverge and they clearly diverge on how to address uh, China's development. So I would say that uh, finally, uh, uh, just to wrap up, um, I would say that perhaps there are three ways to uh, measure China's power and influence uh, in in global politics today. So the first would be uh, measuring Beijing's ability to convert its economic weight into political influence. And this is an area where Beijing has invested uh, heavily. Number two would be um, Beijing's ability to maintain an innovation advantage over other countries, other democracies. Number uh, third would be um, Beijing's capacity to shape key international institutions and also to set standards. So um, to conclude, I would say that for me, the question that I would address um, and I would find most relevant is how do we manage what China is today? Because China is here. So it's, I, in my view, it's not a rising power that almost suggests that there is something that we're waiting for to happen. It, things are already happening. China is here. And um, I th think we are already in the process of uh, perhaps finding a consensus among democracies to, to address the kind of challenges that come with uh, China's development. So uh, I, I would stop here so that we have more of an interaction and I look forward to um, hearing views from from my uh, fellow panelists. So I'll, I'll stop here. And now the similar question goes to uh, Young and I. How do you see China, whether China is a declining power or still a rising power? First of all, uh, thank you very much, Dominic, for this kind invitation and uh, great pleasure to be here with um, Suja and Jacob, uh, two excellent scholars on China. And, uh, you know, uh, hopefully we'll have a very interactive and engaging session for the next one hour or so. But uh, your question is very interesting. And uh, for me, um, you know, it is as much as a dilemma, uh, um, like, uh, you know, looking at the questions from a varied point of view, because I have lived and worked on China in India for last, you know, one and a half decade before I moved to Europe. So as Suja rightly pointed out, um, you know, during her uh, remarks that it, it, it's all about perception. So when you look at China from an Indian point of view, from holding an Indian perception, China looks a kind of a different power. And from an European point of view, obviously there is a different connotation attached with China's rights. So therefore, let me uh, provide a you know more contrasting viewpoint um, how the regions look at China uh, and what uh, what we could make out of China's future rights. Now coming back to your question, how do understand China's rise? Is China a really a rising power or a declining power? I think I would call it uh, at a at a first go, China is a rising authoritarian power. Um, and the reason I say that it is a rising power but an authoritarian power because the kind of systemic discrepancies are there in China. Uh, on the one hand, we are seeing that this is a country which is very closely linked with the global politics, global economy, global societies, um, and there is an opportunity for China to rise with the rest of the world. But on the other hand, the, there is an uh, autocratic authoritarian setup within China, which is not really allowing China to rise politically. And I think there is a lot of uh, domestic grievances and difficulties within China, which is making itself to move more into an authoritarian power rather than a decline, uh, rather than a democratic power. So I think I would call it more of a rising and authoritarian power. But at the same time, let me also deconstruct this whole no notion more from an Indian and European point of view in a contrasting uh, 
viewpoint. If we see from an Indian viewpoint and, uh, you know, sitting in India, I think from time to time, China has posed significant challenges for India and the rest of the regions, um, rest of the countries in the region, in South Asia and in the neighboring country. Um, as we know, between China and India, um, there was a war, you know, six decades back in 1962, where China attacked India. So primarily China's perception in India is, um, you know, a, a kind of stereotyped uh, suspect power. So therefore, um, no matter how much China talks about its peaceful rise or peaceful development that, uh, you know, it talked about at the beginning of the century, uh, you know, many Indian strategists and the Indian uh, pan-Indian perception is that China is a suspect power. And particularly if we see China's activities and uh, behavior over the last few years uh, under uh, President Xi Jinping, uh, and, uh, many Indian people would like to call China as a suspect power. But at the same time, from a global point of view, or let's say more from an European global point of view, one can say that um, China is a revisionist power of a different nature. Now, what is that revisionist power of a different nature? China is a revisionist power which is trying to make rapid changes to the global governance architecture. So therefore, it is more of a revolutionary revisionist power. We know that you know when it, it talks it talks about rising powers or developing economies, developing economies are particularly uh, revisionist power, but in an evolutionary sense. For for example, India, for example, many countries in the south, uh, you know, global south, they are rising powers. But in the case of China, uh, even though in many contexts it is still a rising power, but it is revising the rule of the game in a massive manner. And therefore, for me, China is a revolutionary revisionist power. And in the context of Europe and the global norms, I think the way the Chinese are building up infrastructure, the way the Chinese are, you know, um, um, uh, uh, trying to change the status quo of the regions in, in different uh, sectors, uh, sectors of the world politics, and the way the Chinese are actually imposing themselves um, as an as a influential power, as an influential economic power in global institutions, those indicates that China is a revolutionary revisionist power. So when it comes to India and in the Asian regions, China behave more as a suspect power. China has a very strong, you know, um, um, foreign policy approach to change the status quo. It has been very assertive and aggressive towards the neighbors when it comes to land border issues uh, with India, uh, when it comes to maritime issues with the Southeast Asian countries, when it comes to contesting the territorial or the maritime territorial issues with Japan. Uh, it has equally, you know, posed a strong posture vis-a-vis um, -vis Taiwan. So it is uh, increasingly being seen as a suspect military power, suspect authoritarian power. But at the same time, at the global level, um, it is emerging more as a revol revolutionary revisionist power. The two other points I would like to make um, is that I think uh, we can also see China's rights um, in a comparative point of view. Um, assessing each of these decades of the 21st century. If we see the first phase, the early phase of the of this 21st century, China's rise was always a debatable issue, but there were, you know, um, economic reforms associated with China's rise. There were military reforms were associated with China's rise. Equally, more importantly, I think, there are political reforms associated with, with, with China's rise. So the first decade of the 21st century, under uh, primarily uh, under the leadership of Hu Jintao, we saw China, uh, you know, uh, becoming a strong power economically, militarily, as well as politically. But towards the second decade of the 21st century, we saw China burning down the political reforms under Xi Jinping, and China becoming more as a military power, and as an economic power, even though economically China has been struggling for some time, but still it is a potent economic power. It is a strong economic power when it comes to global politics. So the change we saw in the second decade of the 21st century is likely to continue to the third decade as Xi Jinping continues in power. And therefore, I don't necessarily see that China is returning back to that first decade of, you know, uh, relatively peaceful China. In fact, we'll see more and more aggressive and assertive China in coming years, in coming decade. 
uh, as long as Xi Jinping continues to be in power, and even though there will be a, a change of guards after Xi Jinping gives up the power, we are not really sure whether China will ultimately shed away its authoritarian image and its suspect power image. So therefore, I would read China more as a rising authoritarian power, uh, even though politically it is declining, the values, the norms, the democratic system within China is almost buried. And therefore, I would call China's rise more as a rising authoritarian power, uh, posing a strong ch challenge to the uh, you know, global politics, particularly to the competing powers in Asia and uh, Europe. Thank you for this. Uh, two cents on China rising declining status. Uh, Jakub, what, what are your takes on this, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think I, I would slightly build upon of what the, my predecessor said, especially Yaganat's uh, remarks on the revisionist nature uh, of, of China's uh, international standing now. Uh, I see it in a quite similar way. I've tried just to give uh, some of my impressions on why this happened. So basically, I think in terms of the general question of is China a, a rising power still, I think it is, but the easy period of this rise is already over. And I think it can be seen in the party talk, in the party uh, discourses already. Um, just to pick one concept, uh, the, the period of strategic opportunity that appeared in, a, in the party talk in at the beginning of the century, where all the stars aligned for China to, to rise and build up, it's no longer there. I mean, it, the concept is there, but it's been nuanced uh, and increasingly so. Uh, so if we just compare 19th Congress and 20th Congress, you still can see those, but a lot of elements are added, saying that the, if there is a period of opportunity, but there's a number of black swans and gray rhinos and risks and so many things happening that it this demands a change in China's policy. So I think they're aware that they are in this kind of situation when the growth is and the rise is not a given anymore. And then there's the question of how would they react to this new reality? And I think I, I, we see a lot of indications on where they are going, just building upon to what my colleague said here. Uh, I think there are two kind of intertwined uh, elements to this. One being the internal situation and, of course, the external environment. It, it cannot be separated, but for the sake of just the debate, I'll try to do it. So basically, starting from the internal point, I think the, the yet again, the easy growth period is over. The, 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 the social economic paradigm of China's development that's been set up in the 1980s is no longer there, especially in terms of economic uh, development. I think uh, everybody is aware, including the, the top echelon of China's Communist Party, that it's not going to fly anymore. They're just wrestling with the situation, with the debt overhang, with uh, the lack of social mobility that's starting to appear. They know something's not working uh, there, but they're still incapable of kind of making a decisive breakthrough. Maybe we'll see that in Xi Jinping's third term. But also uh, all the things concerning a party's legitimacy that hinged on on this very economic aspect is already got a question mark on it. So I think it pushes the CCP to, and this is the indication we see now, to more control. That's the thing they they know. That that's the thing they uh, they are used to: social control, economic control, and so on. So we we see an increasingly so. Uh, the, introduction of authoritarian and sometimes even totalitarian uh, instruments to control the society. And as they do it, they are, they are becoming increasingly uh, uh, different from the international environment, to, to put it mildly. Their, uh, their economic system, that the, the things they do vis-a-vis -vis ethnic minorities, vis-a-vis -vis their own uh, society, we, vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong and what, in their minds, the future of Taiwan, it's all becoming so inconsistent with the international environment that they know they are just can't go into the existing international order because they're so different. And, and I think they know it. And now I think it most, I mean, 
I would hope for in most of the Western uh, observers to comprehend this, but I think that's that's the way forward. And of course, there's the external factor that I already touched upon. Of course, the US is seeing this. It's uh, partially about maintaining the international order, uh, partially about this kind of mercantilistic power politics that is also there. Uh, but anyways, this forms international environment that is increasingly hostile toward China. And these are two, the internal and external, two like mutually reinforcing elements that I think, first of all, are making the environment more and more unstable for China. That's the end of the, the period of strategic opportunities because they're no longer there. They need to fight, they need to uh, uh, fendle, yeah, they need to struggle uh, with, with the environment. Yeah, they're, they're fighting uphill. They used to, to fight downhill. They were having you know, an open road to development. Now they have to fight. And then again, it reinforces their own conceptions on how the future will look like. So uh, coming back to, to the main question, it's so much harder to answer this because the, you know, the path that we've seen in the last 40 years is no longer there. They rise hinges upon their, the, the success of their revisionist agenda. And if they don't succeed, then the, they will not rise anymore. And what we are seeing is the world being increasingly polarized around those this very question. With some countries saying, "Yes, this revisionist China is our ally," just like Russians think. Some many other countries, but not too many of them, already kind of place their bet on China. And the the other kind of more or less consistent group of countries saying that they're against it. And I think that politically, the political Kind of environment would decide whether China will rise or not, but unfortunately, this puts us on a structural kind of conflict pathway. Mm, thank you for this. Uh, what we can see here, that's the end of opening and reform uh, periods that rhyme with strategic opportunity, as was mentioned a minute ago. And this is a big question, how the Communist Party of China will manage this different environment, different surroundings across the country to keep China's rise, as you all discussed. My question now goes to Zuza. We see a lot of tensions between uh, Taiwan and China, or China and Taiwan, put it that way. Uh, of course, there are a lot of rumors about possible military um, let's say, invasion interventions to, to name after what Russians uh, are doing in Ukraine. But to what degree China under Xi Jinping, what we see, what we perceive a rather strong leader, uh, can influence Taiwanese normative agenda vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, elections? What are your understanding of this, please? Yes, uh, well, it's a very timely question, of course, because what we are seeing right now in the Taiwan Strait in terms of the intensity of the tension is, is an unprecedented level. And this comes uh, in particular uh, following um, the visit of Nancy Pelosi of the U.S. Congress, Speaker of the U.S. Congress back in August. The heavy-handed response we saw from Beijing uh, was uh, another signaling, I believe, from Beijing that there is no compromise uh, on China for the CCP. And uh, we could see this reinforced again in the 20th Party Congress. So the report talks uh, a lot about Taiwan, not in a new way, uh, just uh, continuing the same line on Taiwan being a core issue and framing this as a, the Taiwan question. Um, so looking at the document, uh, it says that resolving the Taiwan question and realizing China's complete reunification is for the party a historic mission and commitment and a shared aspiration, a natural requirement for realizing the rejuvenation of the Chinese, not new language, um, but it also says that Taiwan is China's Taiwan and resolving the Taiwan question is a matter for the Chinese. So clearly there is no room here for, for the Taiwanese people, uh, which is the position that is held by 
the president, uh, the, the you know the democratically elected president of Taiwan, and the political leadership uh, in Taiwan in power, and a view that is shared, uh, I would say, by the majority of the people here. Uh, and this is to no less extent a result of Beijing's own doing. So it's backlash, it's backfiring that that aggressive behavior that China has displayed or Beijing has displayed across the straits um, in the past years, but increasingly so. That's what I meant earlier by the unprecedented level of, of intimidation, pressure, using economic coercion, disinformation, cyber attacks. So all of this um, you know, is, is clearly rejected in Taiwan, uh, and it is done so not top down, but bottom up through the, the democracy of Taiwan. And it's leading to a reinforcing of an already mature or democracy. And this, um, just to point out, since I am in Taiwan, this Taiwan question, there is no Taiwan question when you ask the people in Taiwan. Actually, it makes them uh, smile in a way, because there is no question <laughs> when it comes to uh, their future relationship with the PRC. When it comes to Taiwan, it's clear that uh, uh, where Taiwan stands, where what people in Taiwan care about is their democracy, and also to have uh, the freedom to choose for them themselves what they want, not to have it imposed by uh, Beijing. So uh, clearly the Taiwanese democracy is the asset that Taiwan has, and this is also what is to the internalization of Taiwan. I think that that's a very perhaps accurate way of describing how Taiwan is perceived and how Taiwan's agenda is really um, I think pretty strongly set on on the future being a democratic Taiwan that is um, shaped by the will of the people, and that we see through the elections. We see that uh, through a st strong civil society, and um, of course, I said earlier that it is a strong democracy, but it's not perfect because democracy nowhere is perfect, I would say. Uh, and we have to remember also that there is a variety of voices in Taiwan. So when I talk about what Taiwan wants and what the people of Taiwan want, you know, we have to be mindful of this variety or of this diversity rather, uh, be because not everyone's on the same page of how to go forward in relations with the PRC. So I think this is to a great extent shaped and reinforced by the aggression that comes through uh, from from China. So I suspect and I, I feel confident that this is not an agenda that is going to be um, impacted by Beijing in the sense of an intimidation or coercion that will be effective in um, bringing Taiwan on board. It will, it is all already backfiring and it's pushing Taiwan closer to democratic allies and the United States, of course, but Japan and also the European Union and member states, in particular, some more than others. So I think uh, th there is no doubt when, as far as I'm concerned in terms of uh, Taiwan's future um, in the near future, as long as Taiwanese democracy is maintained and shaped bottom up, um, I I think that the coercion that comes through is not going to to interfere with that, that process. On the contrary, it will reinforce it. Right. Thank you. And how to understand in this particular context the kind of Taiwanese identity and to what degree uh, the new generation of people might be resilient towards the People Republic of China tries to do. Uh, in terms of reshaping the status of democracy uh, in Taiwan. W what are your understanding here, understandings? Yes, well, Taiwanese identity is, I think, a fascinating question. And, and as someone who is a foreigner here, I find that um, every day uh, I learn something about how people feel about their Taiwanese identity. Again, there is um, a great um, variety of views that shape people's identity. And I would say, if I, I'm correct, perhaps uh, 
this is something that different people might view differently. But in my own perception, what I feel that there is a very there is a common element in the in shaping the political identity of the people in Taiwan, which is this strong attachment to democracy and, and values such as freedom of speech um, and fundamental values, which are at the core of Taiwanese identity politically speaking. But in terms of culture, I would say a, a lot of the Taiwanese people that I speak to who feel strongly Taiwanese, they, they also feel Chinese in terms of their culture and their um, attachment to, culturally speaking, to their Chinese roots. Um, so I think there's, again, different views. For some, the Chinese element is more tangible or strong, more strongly present in my experience. For others, being Taiwanese means, as I said earlier, being able to choose for themselves uh, how they want to see their future and really not wanting to have to do anything with the PRC and the, the communist regime and authoritarian uh, values. So the resilience, I think, is key. And I think the democratic resilience that Taiwan has and Taiwanese society has reinforced is another core value. And we've seen this reinforced also through through um, throughout the pandemic. Uh, the resilience and this trust between the government and the people in, in working together uh, to address a public health uh, emergency through transparency. Transparency is at the core, and it, without transparency that the government has ensured there we wouldn't be here. Um, and that sort of transparency is not just, of course, in managing the pandemic, but it's an element that has been present also in managing the military threats that, uh, that China poses uh, through um, the uh, provocations and the military exercises around Taiwan uh, and the Ministry of Defense uh, on a regular or daily basis rather uh, publishes uh, every single instance when uh, the PRC, uh, the PLA uh, does an exercise around Taiwan or, or uh, interferes with uh, the air defense identification zone, zone of Taiwan. So democratic resilience is, is uh, I think, one of the strongest, but not the only asset that Taiwan has clearly, and perhaps we will talk about that later when we go to talk about semiconductors. Uh, right, thank issue. you. Thank you. All right. Now we're discussing kind of the normative issues. And uh, my question goes to Yaganov. And uh, following this issue of normative agenda, let's say, to what degree India might be part of the picture here, to, to what degree India might play a role in shaping like-minded countries coalition to face the rise in China as a normative power? Please. I think this is a very interesting question, um, but I think um, um, just to answer your question directly, yes, India can play a leading role in terms of building that required coalition um, at the international stage, particularly in the region of Indo-Pacific today that we are talking about. But before that, I think we need to understand the complexities of the issues that are there with China, both as a normative power and as a non-normative power. And I think if we see the history and history of the Chinese Communist Party, I think there are three issues that are always um, or have always been, you know, troubling the Chinese Communist Party. One is the national security issues. You know, the Chinese Communist Party are always uh, concerned about the domestic national security issues because there are problematic issues within China. Uh, let's say uh, the issue of Tibet, the issue of uh, Xinjiang, uh, you know, the, the divide between urban and rural China, all of these domestic issues have always troubled China and China have seen these issues as national security issues. The second issue that, uh, you know, that has troubled China over the years are the issue of, you know, territorial integrity and sovereignty. And I think Chinese Communist Party have used the territorial logic and the sovereignty issues to unite the Chinese people uh, to its favor. And I think uh, that is one aspect which 
uh, you know, um, in a way explains uh, the China's external and foreign policy behavior, the way China is behaving today, why it is behaving, because the party wants to portray the its people and domestic audience certain issues in certain manner when it comes to the territorial integrity issues and sovereignty issues. The third issue, which is very critical, is the image of the Chinese Communist Party. So by you know giving a positive spin to the national security issues, the territorial integrity and sovereignty issues, the party has always tried to portray it itself as the custodian guardian of the China's future. And therefore, the image of the Chinese Communist Party has accordingly been portrayed to the Chinese people. If we see these three um, you know, points into together, I think one power in the world politics today, which has always posed some degree of challenge to China, is India. If we see historically, uh, when it comes to China's domestic issues, which China today you know, calls it as a national security issues, there are domestic issues which has closely been linked with, uh, with India or the rivalry with India. For example, the Tibetan issue, for example, some of the Himalayan episodes, Himalayan, you know, bordering issues, uh, or for example, you know, issues um, which are there within China, uh, in, in a communist China, uh, where they have seen India as a democratic power emerging and, you know, trying to pose this challenge to the Chinese Communist Party. So India has been seen in an contested manner from the China's domestic as well as the foreign policy issues. Similarly, when we talk about the territorial integrity, sovereignty issues, when you talk about the image of the Chinese Communist Party, it is the democratic setup of in India. It is the resilient India and rise of India as a democratic power in world politics. The stable rise of India as a, dom, you know, as a democratic power has posed a maximum challenge to CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. And therefore, the Chinese have always seen India as a competing power and as a rival power. Even though at times they have shown India, uh, you know, a controlled aggression, a controlled assertiveness, but they have seen India primarily as a competing power. Today, they are seeing India as a rival power because the way India is portraying itself and India's rights uh, has been one of those astounding aspects of world politics today. India has been a uniting force in Indo-Pacific, and it is the, you know, the hub of the Indo-Pacific power today. Um, so therefore, when it comes to India and the perception on India, uh, the Chinese have seen India more as a uh, contested power. And therefore, um, you know, they have seen the values, the norms, and the, you know, the gravitas that India brings in the Indo-Pacific regions to challenge China. So therefore, the Chinese have been always disturbed in recent time about India's rise. Now, coming back to your question from India's point of view, even though India knows that it can be, you know, a unifying power in terms of building a coalition among the like-minded countries, what has actually prevented India all this while not to play that role or to fall short in terms of playing that role in terms of building a, a like-minded countries coalitions to against China? is India's uh, you know, economic um, deficiency vis-a-vis -vis China. At the beginning of this century, if we compare the Chinese and economic comprehensive national power status, the Chinese comprehensive national power status uh, with India was almost at the same level. But today, after two decades of the 21st century, the, the Chinese economic volume and the comprehensive national power status has been massive. In fact, the Chinese economy today is four and a half, five times higher than the Indian economic volume. So today when we are talking about the competency, China today operates from a position of strength, being a predominant economic power, whereas India is constrained by its own economic uh, agendas, economic uh, you know, constraint, even though it is a rising, a rising economy and India's economic rise in global affairs today looks much more stable but still India is not really that a competent power to build that coalition which is required against China. So therefore, in, there is a prospective role for India to build that coalition, but India is unable to play that role. But with the rise of the maritime politics and the rise of the, you know, um, the, the, the divide between the authoritarian power and the democratic power, I think many countries in the world are seeing India's rise as a stable and as a stable phenomena and peaceful 
um, on a on a actual practice, and therefore they want to bind together with India in the broader Indo-Pacific coalition. So therefore, India is emerging as a central fugal power in the Indo-Pacific narrative today, and therefore there is a prospective role which is you know waiting for India to play. But at the same time, its economic constraint is limiting India's power, and therefore we will see a equipoise, equicordial relationship um, India maintains with both the autocratic power or the authoritarian powers, as well as the democratic power in the Indo-Pacific regions. So therefore, on the one hand, India is trying to have a very cordial, <coughs> excuse me, cordial and stable relations with China and Russia, even though the relationship with China is not in best order that India enjoys, but still India is maintaining a very equicordial relationship with China and Russia on the other hand. On the Indo-Pacific front, India is building up its coalitions to maintain a very cordial, equicordial and, uh, uh, you know, equiposed relationship with the democratic powers in the Indo-Pacific. So therefore, India can play a consensus building role, but then um, it is not really competent enough to play that centrally, um, you know, central power to build that con con confidence and consensus in the Indo-Pacific region. Interesting points about India's position here. Uh, Jakub, to what degree the Central European countries, the governments, can, to, can take uh, China model? Because China, with 16 plus one platform, almost 10 years ago, introduced itself as a part of economic development in the region, to a certain degree, translating its uh, own uh, understanding of political uh, mm, uh, political uh, structures into the region. So to what degree uh, the Central European governments can take the China model? How, how do you understand this? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I think uh, the relationship between China and the Central European states should be seen primarily as a very interesting case study of how China approaches the developing world in general. That was the primary approach they had back in 2012 when they kind of uh, started to develop comprehensive relationship with Central Europe. They basically copied uh, regional platform schemes they developed in Africa and elsewhere and kind of applied it to the to to the region here. Uh, just just to prove their thinking when Xi Jinping was in Warsaw, he made this peculiar remark, but I think very telling, saying that China Central European relationship is a part of the South South relationship the global south relationship with some north south uh, characteristics which basically explains their their learning curve <laughs> as they started with the global south approach and then find out it's not working fully and i think the the terms of norms is one of the crucial elements of what they learned and how the region pushed back uh, against what they brought i think some of the things that are norm related were not a kind of a master plan to impose norms on the region. They just came along the way that the way China acts, the way China interacts, brings some inherent norms to the table, which I think in the making of the relationship, uh, the region pushed back against. That's the main argument. Uh, with a strong caveat that we are talking about uh, at least 17 uh, countries that were subject to this push. Uh, now, the format itself is only 14 plus one, but used to be 16 and 17 plus one. And the reactions were very different along the region. It, regionally speaking, I think the region pushed back against the, those, but there are exceptions which I will talk about. So basically, I, I see three general kind of uh, strains of norms that China brought to the region. One was the vision, the, the global norms. And uh, here, coming back to the issue of revisionism, I think when they came to the region, they, they came with this kind of soft revisionism, that is uh, building coalitions within existing international order, WTO, UN, uh, with this whole uh, bring justice back to the global government agenda, uh, asking the countries to, to, to forge a common approach on reform of WTO and all the things that I think are no longer on the table. 
I mean, they're still doing this, but then came another kind of strain of global norms, which was openly revisionist. They were not super open about this, but you can see traces of that, just working against the US hegemony in general and just, you know, uh, uh, re revising the order all around the board. That, that's the first level. The, the second is kind of regional engagement norms when what they offered was a sinocentric multilateralism. That is a thing that appeared as multilateral on the surface, but in fact was a kind of hub and spoke mechanism where you have the, in theory, you, you're having a summit with 17 countries and China, but in practice you have 17 dialogues where China just calls the shot everywhere because they're the only one that kind of control the, the whole process. And the third uh, layer is the norms on internal government uh, governance, uh, like spending money, building stuff, uh, engaging different uh, stakeholders in the process. They brought it along with uh, the credits, the, the them building the infrastructure and so on. And in a way, all of those three levels are are linked together because they are kind of they they, are, they indeed are linked. They they do not come as a package, but they just interact. And I think um, the, the most interesting thing to learn from this case study is how this works in practice in the European environment. Uh, that's why I used to say that in a way, Central Europe is, has a very unique position on understanding China and the global South because we were subjected to the same kind of set of policies. But uh, in terms of uh, the question of the, did the region buy it, most of the region did not, and most of some of the most fervent critics of China already withdrew from the thing, uh, uh, like the belt. They just on, don't want to have anything to do with that on any level. Uh, other other countries are put the relationship in a coma. The the sixteen plus one is kind of brain dead because. Uh, with no official kind of declaration, many countries are just not engaging in it. And that I think constitutes most of the region and certainly most of the EU countries within the region. And of course there are exceptions which are very interesting and uh, particular two of them. Uh, first, uh, Hungary and second, Serbia, which uh, I think uh, subscribe to that with an important caveat that both Vucic in Serbia and Orban in Hungary had the, these kind of political strategic goals in their minds even before I think China entered the region. It's not that China imposed those norms. They've kind of given the, a very fertile ground, a policy space to kind of expand that. If the, well, those countries wanted to play against the West, Europe and the US, China was giving them a helping hand. When they wanted to build oligarchic structures based on public money, China was giving them credit and actually enabling them to do so. Uh, and of, of course, they, both of them treat China quite instrumentally. They, they, it's just a part of their policy uh, toolbox. Uh, but in a way, of course, uh, without China and Russia, also, especially in terms of Hungary, they wouldn't be able to play this game with the West. But China is a reinforcing and augmenting factor here. Uh, but along the way, as they one of the they're very one of the very few that actually entered the path of this package, uh, the, the China has, has reinforced all of that. And uh, I, I think, in a way, it's also very interesting. Because I think in, in there are some cases when this works very similarly throughout the world. I mean, it, it can be thought of as a kind of a model with regional discrepancies, of course, but in terms of Chinese thinking, Chinese acting, it's, it's pretty uh, similar. So I think that makes Central Europe a very interesting case. Thanks, Sue. Uh, the big portion of informality all across global south is part of China's pretty, pretty, uh, the way they, they translate the norms from a domestic agenda. Briefly, uh, a very quick question to all of you. Uh, 
to what degree and wherever the collective actions are possible when it comes to, um, you know, countering uh, China's rise, in particular in these normative areas, and how to incentivize like-minded countries, how to incentivize India, Taiwan, and Central Europe, for example, from, from this perspective. And I will go with the order with uh, Yaganath, Zuza, and Yakub. Please answer quickly and shortly to this question. I think again, this is an interesting um, debate to you know think about and uh, you know prepare an answer. And uh, I'm sure there is no easy answer to this question. But I think collective action is not the solution at a time when China is already a uh, you know significant global power in terms of its economic outreach, in terms of its diplomatic outreach, and most importantly, it is a key member at the United Nations Security Council, permanent member. Uh, and therefore, I think collective action is not a solution. At it, there might not be a collective action plan also, uh, which which might not really be feasible. But I think my short answer here would be: I think we need a collective decision on key issues, which must translate into a collective action on certain selected issues. And I think there we need a grand coalition among the like-minded countries and. Perhaps we need to incentivize in terms of building that, uh, you know, coalitions or, you know, uh, building a collective decision action plan. And I think that is very much possible because we cannot corner or isolate China on each and every issue. There are critical issues where a consensus can be built. For example, you know, on, on technology, the way China is emerging as a technological power and the way it is emerging as a cyber security threat. There might be a coalition emerging, and uh, there would be, you know, adequate platforms to build that consensus, uh, and uh, probably to incentivize uh, the like-minded countries. The other thing is that I think we need also a greater coalition and collective decision-making approach in um, bigger multilateral institution where Chinese effectiveness can be reduced. I think that is more necessary um, in order to you know, have some kind of action plan to check China's progress or China's action plan, uh, because it would not be really possible to build that collective action you know, on, on, on a whole range of issues. But I think if we try to have a some sort of coalition in select multilateral institutions to raise that necessary awareness, to raise that, you know, necessary coalition, which would be acting as a deterrent, as a diplomatic deterrent, as a Politic, credible political deterrence, there the success lies. And I think we can incentivize some of the like-minded countries to come together to build that coalition. I would uh, just uh, take a you know, few examples. For example, we now propose to establish the IPF, Indo-Pacific uh, you know, Economic uh, uh, Forum. And I think there to build a coalition is not really difficult. So therefore, we need to use that platform to pressurize China on a range of issues. Uh, you know, there are platforms like G7, G20, where a greater coalition can be built in, in terms of checking the Chinese progress or in terms of building that uh, diplomatic economic deterrence, which is required against China. But if we try to have a much more collective action in each and every issues and each and every multilateral institution, that might not really be possible. As I mentioned, China is an effective multilateral power. It is a you know, norm setters in, in, in the global standards. And most importantly, it has huge diplomatic political outreach as a P5 nation in the global politics. Right, Susa, please. Yes, well, I agree with Jagannath. It's not an easy uh, question to answer. And I also agree with some of the points you made, Jagannath, about uh, collective action. I, I would go back to what I said earlier about the consensus that we're seeing among democracies, that there is a rising challenge that democracies face coming from China, but there is no consensus on how to address the, the multiple challenges that China presents to democracies. And the reason why there is no consensus is because of the heavy reliance in terms in terms of um, trade relations with China, which means that we have strategic dependencies and we have 
at the same time, that's the that's the reality. But the positive news is, I would say that as a result of the pandemic and also the recent years, I think there is an awareness now there was a wake-up call several wake-up calls that we need to address those uh, dependencies and we need to boost resilience so i do see opportunity for cooperation perhaps not in in a collective way where everyone is on board but perhaps in a mini lateral formats uh, we've seen that take shape uh, in the indo-pacific between like-minded uh, partners and these are like india japan australia uh, Taiwan. Uh, these are countries that have all been victims of economic coercion coming from China. So I see a smaller groupings that uh, um, allow uh, addressing the problem of uh, countries facing coercion from China and also value. And this is something I think Jagannath also mentioned that we need to think about uh, the deterrence value of the cooperation and collective action. So um, because I mentioned dependencies and reducing dependencies with resilience, and so of course now everyone is looking at ways to diversify away from China and speaking from Taiwan, where about 40% of Taiwan's trade relies on China and about 55% of Taiwanese investment still goes to China. Um, diversification is, is a very big and difficult uh, challenge, uh, but it is something that sooner or later will have to be will have to be undertaken by, by the Taiwanese uh, business circles and also with the incentives of the government, because as long as there is an asymmetric economic trade relationship that gives China or Beijing the leverage over our decisions and, and allows China to interfere in our own um, decision-making processes, then um, collective action cannot really be effective. So I think the the for the near future, because diversification is a long-term plan, and, and in the near future, I think we need to work on consistency, a bit more consistency among uh, democ democratic countries in the hope of this helping us uh, to you know, strengthen that consensus that uh, we need to work together in, in a collective way and using collective weight strategically. I think that goes also as, a, as a, an entity for the European Union and the different member states pursuing their national interest uh, at the expense of European interest. So, um, yes, perhaps I stop here for now. Thank you. Minilateralism might be a kind of a solution uh, in the short term uh, uh, period. Jakub, please, any collective actions are possible now? Actually, I, I, I must say I fully agree with uh, Zuza's overview. I mean, this is the key problem here in terms of forming like-minded kind of coalitions. I think we are, most of the democracies are already like-minded in terms of public perceptions. If you look at the Pew research and how positive people are about China's rise and would they see Xi Jinping as the leader of the world, it's like super negative, basically everywhere. Even in countries that are most, Western countries that are most nuanced in terms of China policy, like Germany, 70, 80 percent of population is already there. Uh, the, the big question is how to uh, how to appeal to those very powerful stakeholders and constituencies that have vested interest in maintaining the current uh, status with China. Uh, this this just I'm just kind of rephrasing the things that Susanna has said, uh, but I think that's the, the key issue here um, is to how to untangle this very dense web of, of global connections with China without killing the globalization as a whole, because it serves its purpose, but identifying, and this is a very careful, meticulous work to identify certain strategic elements that are a potential or current, uh, a, a potential instrument or an instrument that's been currently used by China 
to influence our internal politics and primarily uh, kind of working against us taking a collective action because they are aware of it, of this, of this you know, forming uh, of this like-minded nations. However, however uh, you know, vague this concept is, I think they sense it. If you, if you see how they talk about strategic autonomy in Europe, they are just spinning it in a way that drives a wedge between the US and Europe, and I think that works for other poles in this uh, global kind of thing. They 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 were furious about uh, the the, the Indo-Pacific, some of the Indo-Pacific countries uh, jo joining the NATO summit. Yeah, they they can see that this is some, somehow happened, but I think uh, I mean not not downplaying uh, the the norms uh, issue. Because they matter, I think the actual untangling, a smart untangling that will not kind of kill the global economy, is key here. Because when the push comes to shove, uh, and and something happens, you'll you'll have, in fact, a deep conflict uh, within democracies, with population being pro Taiwan because they care about democracy and norms, but. At the same time, certain very powerful vested interest groups that actually provide jobs to those people, but they earn a lot of money out of China, they will work against this. I think we are seeing this very uh, mechanism basically everywhere, including in the US. It's not that Germany is bad here, the only one. Maybe the US is much more resolute here and determined, but uh, I think the, the, the thing is there. and. Um, I think that's that's the, the 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 situation we're in now, and it will only get tougher because, um, as as I said in the first intervention, I think we'll see even more of that coming. It's it's not we are not going back to those good old to early two thousand times when then everybody could basically uh, believe, and uh, many people wanted to believe that it's not going to happen. Maybe there was a chance that it, this could kind of take the China could take a different path. Uh, I don't know, it's counterfactual. Maybe there was a chance, but I think no, no more. True, that's a big dilemma, how to manage globalization within the process of decoupling and dual circulation economies was announced by the Chinese government a couple of years ago. Now, let me, let me go to the more detailed questions. And the first will go to Jakub about Germany. As you mentioned, Germany a minute ago, uh, how should Western Europe respond uh, in light of Sino-Russian relations after February this year? And what is the role of Germany, uh, German value chains and market in China? To what degree Berlin is afraid of, of the coupling? So, as you said, this is a big dilemma between norms, public opinions and interest groups. Please. Uh, thank you. I think those those two things, uh, Russia and China, are very much linked here, uh, and especially in terms of debates inside inside Germany. Basically, uh, and one point I want to make because before diving in is that I think the relationship between China and Russia is very strong and increasingly so uh, during the last ten months of the war. They've become even more strategically connected with important uh, caveats on the, the places where their interests diverge and when they don't want, the Chinese don't want to carry extra weight for the Russians. I think there's no alternative to Putin's regime when it comes to this revisionist trend of China's policy. Of course, there are globalists, peaceful rise people in China too. They've been basically pushed out of the mainstream by Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is certainly more revisionist. And, and, and Russia is the only country with considerable might and that is fully determined to overthrow the US hegemony. Actually, in, in February, it made an irreversible uh, step that I think makes China sure that Putin will not talk with the US, it will not change side, and there are no alternative partners of this kind. Even Iran can change side in two weeks, you know, but, but, but Russia 
with Putin's regime if you want. That being said, uh, coming back to the Germany question and this more general question here, I think uh, this link is increasingly visible, uh, this, this similarities between those two actors. Uh, they're not identical, of course, they need two different approaches, but they're somehow linked in a way they are ready to use weaponized interdependence to play against us in the West. Uh, Russia, what Russia did to Europe is that it basically destroyed decades of thinking that it's not possible for this to happen because the interdependencies are so big that Russia will never use energy against Germany. That was the precondition here. And yet Russians destroy the Nord Stream too, you know, and they, they are they blackmailing Europe and so on. Of course, Russia is much more autarkic uh, in, 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 in their economic kind of structure. So they are much more audacious. They are actually capable of using all the things they, they, they can to, to push against us. Maybe China is much more inter interconnected, so it will be more careful. But the, the main takeaway I got from talks with people in, in Germany and other European countries now that are linked with China, like the Netherlands, is that if Russians were capable of doing this, then China might be too. And I think this is a, the thing that really set off this uh, process of what Azuza was talking about, about increasing resilience, about diversifying. It's not that uh, they're, they're totally determined to do this. They're not like the US on this point. But I think the risk is there. It was not there before, but uh, it's on a very conceptual level thinking that the, the, the ultimate revision of this order with the use of globalization against Europe is possible because one actor, which is Russia, which is very close to China, did it. And they agree on so many things. They disagree on others, but the most crucial ones, making the world safe for autocracy <laughs> and then uh, overthrowing the US hegemony by all means as necessary including economic coercion war. I think they're, they're basically on the same page there. And if, if they are, that the West should prepare for this, preferably in an orderly manner that will not deprive us of, of wealth too much, that will be as, as least costly as possible. And I think multilateralism is a good approach here because if you have so many different interests there, it's, it's better to pick smaller group of countries with that are on the same page in certain area and work on this rather than using WTO to kind of do this because it's, it's I think, impossible. Okay. Sorry. I think Just this is the... Yes, oh. you're going to... Uh, yes, please go. Go on. Okay. I think this is a very interesting question and I think... Um, if we are talking about, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, global supply chain and how India would be positioning itself, and I think um, how India wants to take uh, advantage of the whole process here, uh, it's a whole set of um, complicated issues. But I think what we need to keep it in mind is that, um, like China in many sense, even though we know that the Chinese economy is, has, has evolved, uh, and has become much stronger uh, over the last two decades or so. Um, and even though on the Xi Jinping, they are having a slowdown in the GDP growth, China is still a very pertinent economy when it comes to influencing the game globally. So therefore, when we're talking about global supply chain, when we are talking about you know um, semiconductor issues, when we are talking about decoupling issues, everything has to be taken on a case-to-case -case basis. And that is really necessary because we cannot really generalize by saying there will be a credible grand coalition existing against China, uh, which will pressurize China to an extent where China will give up its own demand. And that's never going to happen because many of the 
uh, economies in the world politics, be it the stronger economies, be it the developed economic world or the developing economic world, in one way or the other, they are very strongly linked with China. Now, when it comes to the global supply chain and the, you know, the, the value system, what we have to keep it in mind when it comes to India is that India has a lot of potential. Yet, as I mentioned earlier, its economic, uh, you know, uh, competency at this moment is not really giving it enough confidence and boost to act the way it would like to act. And therefore, um, I mean, India is critical to the global value chain. Uh, when it comes to China and possibly to have that alternative hub of global value chain. Um, what China provided uh, two decades back, India could pro provide today. Um, uh, and th therefore, I think this is a credible issue for India to think about it pos positively. But again, I think the problem in India is lack of infrastructure and if uh, environment which will allow the foreign companies to come and invest, um, you know, more openly. Uh, for example, if we talk about the semiconductor industry, uh, you know, uh, having been worth of almost 27 billion in 2021, the Indian semiconductor industry is projected to grow almost 64 billion by 2026. And uh, this will represent a compound annual growth of uh, growth rate of 19%. But none of these chips are manufactured end to end in India so far. And I think that's the problem. And therefore, I think uh, the problem is about infrastructure. The problem is about having a conducive, you know, business friendly atmosphere and environment in India. And therefore, India would like to have a strategy where it would like to invite and lure the foreign companies to come to India. Uh, and then built on areas where India has an advantage, such as chip design. And therefore, you know, each one of these issues are very complex. Um, and therefore, you have seen India's position. During the pandemic, India has banned some of the Chinese applications, uh, partly because of the way China behaved during the pandemic uh, and the way the China-India uh, relationship is going down towards. But at the same time, India has not entirely closed the door in terms of, you know, creating that alternative base uh, against China because India wants to be very careful. India wants to maintain equicordial relations with the, both the world uh, because of because of its own uh, national economic interest. China is still an, uh, you know, credible economic power and India would not really like to create an atmosphere where it has to completely, you know, uh, stop everything in terms of making a contact or a bilateral engagement with China because economic contacts is still one of those credible variables when it comes to easing out the tensions between China and India. And India would not really like to completely stop its engagement process with China. So therefore, when it comes to the global value chain, India wants to act global. Uh, at the same time, India is realistic that it has to build its own infrastructure, its own business atmosphere, credible environment in terms of taking advantage of the um, environment that is building up in Indo-Pacific. And therefore, India would like to put its own domestic issues in order before really jumping into so many issues when it comes to the US-China rivalry. Thank you for this. Well, this is this is the really big question of whether India can be a middle person between the West and China. As you said, India keeps its relations However, may, mainly very limited with China, but still. So my quick question to you, Yaganath, is, is India ready to play this middle person uh, position? I think yes. I think uh, uh, if you see there are two uh, phenomenon, uh, phenomena are attached with India's foreign policy uh, bearings in recent time. One, uh, India is trying to build a uh, much more credible coalition when it comes to middle powers. And I think uh, uh, India is looking beyond US, beyond China, and there India is trying to identify who are these middle powers with whom India could possibly tie up very closely and build a coalition. And therefore you will see uh, India is having today a much more credible partnership with uh, Japan, with Australia, uh, with some of the you know other countries in in, in the European region in the European continent, 
so therefore, I think uh, building a middle power coalition serves India's interest because India is not entirely a struggling economy. India is not really a developed economy. India is somewhere a, a, a middle ranked economy. The second thing is that the kind of issues uh, India deals with, there India also needs to stay with, with so many local powers in the regions, be it island set, set of countries, be it rising economies or poor economies in the in the regions. For example, the geography of India is such that, you know, it is uh, in, in three ways exposed to the Indian Ocean. India's coastal regions, Indian borders are exposed to the Indian Ocean regions from three sides. And I think that is a credible point. India is a sea power. India wants to stay connected with the island set of countries in the Indian Ocean. India wants to also stay connected strongly with the neighboring, immediate neighboring and extended neighboring countries in the ASEAN regions to the Middle Eastern regions. And therefore, you will see a pattern of engagement with the lower economies and, uh, you know, poorer countries in the region. So therefore, India is positioning itself more in the middle ground when it comes to the Indo-Pacific regions. And therefore, many countries are seeing India as the fulcrum of the Indo-Pacific, including the United States, in terms of economic supply chain, in terms of maritime politics, and in terms of you know promoting the credible networks which is required in terms of posing a challenge to China in the, in the Indo-Pacific region. Thanks. Uh, now, the same question about global value chains and semiconductors. Uh, goes to, to Zuzad. It's recently, uh, I've noted for, from media, the, the Taiwanese semiconductors manufacturing company says it will more than triple its investment in, in US plant to 40 billion US dollars. Is the Taiwanese government afraid of losing big assets for the US? I mean, what the Americans trying to do, they really trying to push the capital lane, having all industries, a very uh, new technologies industries in uh, in the United States. Uh, as I see, you know, a semiconductor industry might be kind of a security insurance for Taiwan to a certain degree. Is it possible to relocate the productions elsewhere from a Taiwanese point of view? And uh, yes. Yes, well, this is when it comes to Taiwan, a very relevant question, of course, because as I was saying earlier, and I'd like to go back to the point I made about Taiwan's democratic resilience being one of its strongest assets in the view or in the eyes of the rest of the world. Um, I, If we talk about um, economic resilience when it comes to Taiwan, I think um, because of that reliance that I spoke of and that we have already touched upon when it comes to trade, uh, its reliance on China makes its economic resilience, I would say, not as strong as its democratic resilience. Nevertheless, there it has a unique input that it can bring uh, to like-minded partners' um, efforts to coordinate collective action and to deter Chinese aggression. And that's clearly in the tech industry. So semiconductors, and when it comes to manufacturing advanced semiconductors, as, as we know, that's where Taiwan's strength lies. And, and Taiwan, at the same time, speaking politically or geopolitically, it is interested in increasing its international space to capitalize on this momentum in the support that it has from, from its partners. So if we link these two, the, the, the technical expertise and the geopolitical value, uh, I would say that it is in Taiwan's interest to partner up with like-minded partners that it can trust um, to work together in re re reconfiguring supply chains and uh, semiconductors because the whole semiconductor industry and supply chains uh, is such a complex and uh, geographically specialized kind of value chain that no country, not even Taiwan itself, in spite of its expertise in advanced manufacturing, it can be self-sufficient. So it is in the interest of all these countries to partner up and in a way not to um, become self-sufficient at all, but to to manage this interdependence that they have. And I think this is also language that is at the heart of the European um, 
approach to semiconductors and the EU CHIPS Act also talks about uh, more balanced interdependencies because it is nowhere present as a thought or as an ambition in the European discourse or member states discourse to um, undo trade with China or to stop trading with China. It is about rebalancing the trade that we have with China. It's to rebalance the relationship we have. So um, I would say that it is in Taiwan's interest to, to partner with European countries as well as the United States or Japan because TSMC is looking also at Japan and also other Taiwanese semiconductors uh, semiconductors companies are looking at India to sort of create this, this ecosystem that uh, brings together um, reliable like-minded countries in this advanced chips manufacturing and I think the Europeans really, through the CHIPS Act, speaking from the European perspective now, I think they have really elevated this to a political level. And there's like a political understanding that the vulnerabilities that Europe has, um, it's not sustainable. And, and Europe really needs to be serious about reconfiguring and rethinking um, its relations. And I think, I know there has been criticism that the CHIPS Act is too little, too late. Uh, I am not uh, a semiconductors uh, expert, but I think it's very important to really remind ourselves that what I said earlier about the complexity of semiconductors. So the, there's so many entities and suppliers involved in one semiconductor production that uh, there, we cannot talk about uh, self-sufficiency. We, we really need to talk about the interdependence and, and the balancing of interdependence. So I think it is in Taiwan's interest, to come back to your question, to, um, to strengthen those ties that it can trust, that it can trust. Um, and it is obviously in Europe's interest to increase the share that it has in, in semiconductor, uh, in the global share, because I think at this stage it's, it's about 10%. And this EU CHIPS Act aims at increasing that to 20%. Um, so I think looking forward, this is something that uh, is clearly an area that both Taiwan and European member states have identified as a joint area of cooperation. And this takes me back uh, as a last thought to that collective action that we talked about, because we already have, for example, the and the collective action and the minilateral uh, format, right? The, the supply chain resilience initiative that was put forward in 2021 between India, Australia, and Japan, I believe. And um, I, I think in spite of the fact that uh, Taiwan, uh, ta Taiwan's participation officially in any of these formats is a difficult question. I think Taiwan as a dialogue partner in working groups that Quad has established, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or such as this supply chain resilience initiative. I think we need to start thinking more seriously about how Taiwan's expertise can be embedded um, into these initiatives. And also because this has that deterrence value, I think that I mentioned earlier about the collective action. Thank you for this. Final question to all of you, and I will I will go in, in this order, Jakub, Susan, and uh, Jagannath. What about Global South? After the Party Congress recently, China's promoting China-style modernization. So is it possible from our perspective to compromise values and interests? Uh, and uh, to what degree are democracies can persuade the Global South to support the West or at least remain neutral? Jakub, Zuza, Jagannath, and we are going to the end of this very interesting discussion. Yeah, thank you. I, I think this is one of the, the key questions. Uh, just just a metaphor, not an analogy. Uh, there are many people ask, pose me a question of whether we're entering a new Cold War. Uh, I don't think so. And one of the, my main arguments is that, uh, unlike the Cold War and the Cold War, the Global South that used to be the battlefield back then, 
is no longer one. It's a, 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 a player within this very broad uh, game, let's say. Of course, it's a very diverse region, but in a way, we're talking about populist, fast-growing, strategically independent in their thinking countries that's, uh, just, that they don't have vested interests. You, you can see it in the, in, 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 the, in the conflict. They're just you know, rationally picking sides depending on who offers what. And I think uh, you can see that in case of the conflict, Western conflict with Russia, that's the approach you can see in many countries, including India, I think. Uh, um, but, but also the Gulf states, you know, all over the world. And I, I think we should uh, actually, as the West, in order to have the Global South on board, we should propose the Global South with um, and kind of an offer um, and I think that the, the, the key area, because I will not talk about policy recommendations yet, but the key area is the, the deglobalizing, or it's not about deglobalizing, it's about rebalancing the globalization. The last 40 years of globalization was about investing in China to, to a biggest degree. That was the key industrial and technology knowledge hub that the whole West was investing in. And uh, we still don't know the degree to which the West will kind of turn away from China. Maybe it will be very limited and token kind of rebalancing and diversification. It can be just focused on strategic issues, which are no small thing. Uh, and maybe it, it will go forward even more. And in order to have this, new phase of globalization going, this new re rebalancing going, you'll have to have partners. Uh, and, and, and here, I think, lies the, the key issue here. Uh, how can we approach the global south with, with a viable, attractive offer of this kind that uh, will acknowledge the global south agency with no, no bashing, just kind of talking? normally and i think that's where uh we can compete in terms of uh, the china model which is i think uh extremely spectacular yes but it's already shown us its limitations because if you grow 12 percent a year then further down the road you hit the roadblock and if if you're making it more sustainable perhaps market-based, more transparent, you'll have much more stable environment, much more uh, transparent and kind of democratically leaning environment. And I think that's uh, that's our competing edge here. So that will be my answer. Thank you. Zuzza, please. Thank you. Well, I think uh, Jakub has made a the, the essential points actually I myself had in mind more or less about um, the lack of the problem of the, the lack of real offer that the West has ha had uh, when it comes to um, persuading the global South that being on this side uh, of uh, history is the right side of history when it comes to sustainable development, right? Right. And I also strongly believe that it's more appropriate to talk about rebalancing globalization and not deglobalization. Um, and I think that that's the word I also use when it comes to our future relationship with China. Um, in spite of, uh, you know, the very strong rhetoric coming out of Washington about how we should rethink our relationship with China and having this very exclusive approach also in the Indo-Pacific, that is not the approach that most countries in the region have. And I think what is what makes most countries in the region and the European countries uh, feel uneasy about Washington's rhetoric is that no, none of these countries want to have to choose ch sides between China and the United States. And this is very much the approach that we see in ASEAN countries and European countries also want to have um, to decide for themselves. I mean, that's about strategic autonomy, but that's also about open strategic autonomy, which is in the tech 
uh, field uh, in terms of um, being able to decide for themselves. So the rebalancing of globalization, I think, is more more appropriate. So um, another thought I had listening to Jakub, indeed, the global south, and we should not generalize in the sense that the, there is agency in the global south. So these countries um, that have had a relationship with with Europe, in particular in 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 development or in, or uh, infrastructure development, I think there is um, also quite a lot of uh, resentment uh, in the in these countries vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the West. And uh, I think Beijing has been very skillful in uh, uh, exploiting that and also uh, bringing solutions that are quick fix to to very difficult uh, problems uh, that would not uh, be handled in a sustainable way. I think the idea of, of sustainability is is crucial here. So um, going forward, we need as Western democracies to bring solutions. Uh, I mean, in this regard, I would mention the global gateway, of course, which the EU put forward, again, criticized by many that it's, uh, it's a reaction to to what China has done in the past two decades. Uh, but I think going forward, um, I I believe that the partnership is another thing that Jakub, you mentioned, I, I strongly uh, believe, and that's, I think, increasingly embraced and understood in the EU that this needs to be done in partnership. And that, again, speaking of the Indo-Pacific, our whole Indo-Pacific strategy uh, from the European perspective really relies on partnerships. So um, the question to compromise values and interests. I mean, I think that's a difficult question. Um, and I think we've seen instances, you know, in the in the recent past that, uh, you know, it's a difficult balance. Uh, but I want to believe that um, we've had enough experience of China's behavior in the region so far in the short period that China has been rising after its reform and opening up that has convinced uh, countries that have been dealing with China more closely that uh, there is that lack of balance. And that brings me to, to wrap up back to the idea of rebalancing the way we deal with China and the way China deals with us. So I think a key word here is really rebalancing, not decoupling or not ending, but rebalancing. Thank you. Yagana, now the floor is yours. I think uh, more or less I'll agree with uh, both Suja and Jacob uh, on this, uh, but uh, I think uh, we need to have a more critical introspection to this question, whether it is it really possible to compromise values and interest when we are talking about deglobalization. I think it's beyond that. It's not only about compromising or not compromising. It's much dense and complex issues. When it comes to values and interest, I think many countries throughout the globe, they would see their own national interest. So ultimately, the national interest, the national economic interest, national security interest will matter. And when, it, when we're talking about Global South, we must keep it in mind that China is a much more invested power when it comes to Global South. It has a strong networks in the Global South, and it would be, you know, a premature thought to think about you know, breaking that link between China and the global south. Um, and therefore, my my main argument would be that we need to take uh, issue to issue basis on critical issues. We need to bring and build that, uh, you know, coalition, that much required coalition which is needed. And uh, there we need to put a challenge on China. The other issue is that I would agree with Suja. I think it's not entirely about decoupling. It's not also uh, to entirely to think about, you know, putting a challenge to China and uh, try to decouple everything. And I think it's much complex an issue which need a more grand level of strategic thought and consensus building exercise among the middle ranked economies and the lower ranked economies. And therefore, I would say that, um, you know, when we're talking about decoupling, we also need to think that it's not about, you know, containing the China's rise or China's economic engagement or the Chinese economic influence. 
And I think it's more about talking about how to put issue specific challenges to China on specific sectors. And therefore, we need to talk about a range of uh, scientific issues, uh, cyber tech issues, technological issues. We need to talk about semiconductor issues. Uh, and each of these issues need close introspection and consensus among lower ranked economies and middle ranked economies. And therefore, it would be a very premature thought to talk about building a grand coalition among the global south and uh, you know try to decouple it from china because china is still very much uh, you know invested in global south it has a very strong networks of relationship with the global south the other thing is that the chinese style of modernization and i think the chinese style of modernization is not entirely different from the rest of the global modernization or the modernization that west has built and i think there are similar patterns are there but i think what the chinese style of modernizations are they uh, talking about it is talking about a party late modernization more authoritarian form of modernization and that needs to be questioned and i think the questioning uh, such kind of modernization plan that party within china is building and uh, the kind of uh, invested interest that the party is having to modernize chinese economy is needs to be questioned both in the global south and uh, elsewhere and i think there we need a much more credible platform as earlier we discussed that there are you know supply chain networks have been proposed during the pandemic among australia india japan there are trilateral forums are there there are quadrilateral forums are there so minilateral quadrilateral forums are becoming the hub of the politics and those platforms can be used in terms of consensus building exercises we can you know have a much more um, you know specific discussions on 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 topics that uh, matters to most of these middle ranked and lower ranked economies and there i think it is possible to convince those economies to think about the chinese economic plan to think about the party led economic plan or the party led modernization that that china is trying to promote all this while under xi jinping and i think there we need to really you know invest our thought and build a coalition or of interest to question china's uh, chinese style of modernization and that is very much possible so therefore i would uh, stop here by saying that you know we need to talk about critical issues critical topics in order to build that consensus and uh, this consensus is possible in certain minilateral platforms in certain uh, you know multilateral pl platforms but complete decoupling from china is never a realistic proposition and we should not really even think about that Thank you for this. That's what I've learned from our whole discussion, how to respond to China's rise is to rebalance globalization. That's the first point. A by case by case approach, the second. And through minilateralism. That's the answer, I believe. And thank you very much, all of you, for, for this discussion. I learned a lot. It was a great honor to have you here. Zuza, Jakub and Yogana, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, well, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.